All right. Well, we're in Jeremiah chapter 10 tonight. I'm using the New King James Version uh, for most of this, and uh, I'll indicate if it's from somewhere else. Um, If you remember from chapter 9, as a review from last week, uh, Jeremiah was mourning over Judah's sin, rebellion, and the coming judgment of God. Um, They had lived like they'd been given over to sin. We looked at Romans 1 and what that looks like in terms of being given over to sin when God gives a person or a people over. Uh, Yahweh continued to invite them back into a relationship with himself in spite of their sin. And uh, if you remember, he expressed that he delights in those who are valiant for the truth and those who uh, seek to know him. So knowing the Lord uh, was uh, particularly important. Um, not only as a solution, a remedy, but also as a preventative. Uh, If you look back at chapter 9, verse 24, it speaks of uh, God as um, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. And so he declares this about himself, and it's only a couple of verses in uh, a much longer chapter of uh, mourning and judgment, but it's it's certainly a positive note uh, toward the end of chapter 9. And, you know, we can learn from that uh, just as all of us go through troubles and trials in life that we can go to Psalms to remember who our God is. Uh, So many times David or Asaph or Korah or others, uh, they will start off proclaiming what their problems were, but then they resolve typically at the end of the chapter with a a declaration announcement of who God is and they remember who he is and that uh, brings peace to their souls. Uh, So tonight we're going to continue to see more of God's character and attributes. And as we conclude uh, this uh, four uh, four chapter section called uh, the Temple Sermon, uh, which runs from chapter 7 through chapter 10. Uh, So that is the the Temple Sermon. And this is a poetic dialogue between the Lord and and Jeremiah. Um, and, And so... The, the voice of Jeremiah or the voice of the Lord will hopefully be evident there. Uh, and in this, we'll see uh, that Jeremiah continues to be uh, distressed uh, for the state of his people, the spiritual uh, condition of his people. And yet uh, he pauses to contemplate who and what is like the true God. And certainly the, the, uh, the answer to that is no one and nothing. Um, and so he, he, uh, prays a humble prayer, and he remembers uh, the Lord's identity. And then he considers the misery that's ahead for uh, his people, Judah, uh, with the captivity that has uh, all but become inevitable because of their stubborn rebellion and stubborn hearts. And yet, at, toward the end of the chapter, we'll see that Jeremiah prays for mercy for his people. Um, and yet, he, he prays for justice on the enemy, on the Babylonians, the, the instrument of God's judgment on Judah. And with that, we'll get into the text. And so, um, verses 1 through 5, the ways of the Gentiles. Verse 1, Hear the word of uh, which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed by them. Now let me just pause here to uh, to bring out a point, um, if you look flip back to Ger- uh, Genesis chapter one verses fourteen to sixteen, we see what the signs of heaven are, the good signs of heaven that God created, the stars, the sun, the moon, um, and what does he say about them they 're to divide the day and the night they 're for signs and seasons for days and years, right so these are all good signs that God has uh, created in the heavens. Uh, among all of the other creations. Um, and so they, they, they had imitated, Judah had imitated the surrounding nations. They were learning the ways of the surrounding nations. And when we say Gentiles, think unbelievers, those who do not fear God. So anywhere you see that. But uh, they had imitated those who don't fear God. And when it's speaking of the signs of heaven, uh, it, it's generally agreed and understood that what they were dismayed by were not the good signs, uh, but the unusual phenomenon of heaven. So eclipses, comets, uh, meteors, and those type of thing. Um, it could also refer to the zodiac or astrology. 
and uh, what people uh, look for when they uh, go to those type of um, sources for guidance or for uh, trying to determine what the day is going to hold or what the year is going to hold. Um, but generally, they're the unusual signs, not the, the, uh, the steady signs. Um, if, if any one of us is caught up in any of that, I would just encourage us, please get rid of it. it that is not where we find out anything true. And so um, dismiss that. But I'd also encourage us too, there's, uh, there's an event coming up here on April 8th, which has been uh, advertised, and that is uh, an eclipse that will uh, cross over the United States. And um, there are a lot of people out there who are trying to make something of that that uh, it may not be. And I would just encourage us to not try to fall into the, uh, the tremulous fear that it's caused by people who are trying to, to make something of that event. That, that eclipse event, um, it, I, would, I would call them false prophets. And so uh, please, please don't fall into the ways of the, those type of people. There are things that God can declare, and, and certainly it's sufficient for us to look at those type of events and see the perfect balance in his creation um, and how he, he has, um, has given the heavens to us as a declaration of his glory. Psalm 19, uh, one through four, actually the whole Psalm is wonderful, but uh, I'll just read that. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So when we see these things, give glory to God. And don't be uh, afraid and be dismayed like the Gentiles are. Certainly anybody who is here uh, through the tribulation, they're going to see things in the heavens that none of us could ever have imagined. And that will be a time for dismay. And so let's not go there. <laughs> All right, let me continue on in verse 3 here. For the customs of the peoples are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree. And the image there, the palm tree, is, is kind of like a scarecrow in a cucumber field or a melon patch. Uh, and so um, that's what he means. And they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. So notice in verse 2, again, God's people are called to be different than the Gentiles, those that don't fear God. Um, they're called to be separated to God. And when we say separated, separate, um, we're set apart, we're separated, we're sanctified. That would be the, the, the doctrinal word. So we're sanctified, we're set apart, uh, we're called to be holy as God is holy. So, so God's people are called to be separate to him not fearful like the majority that is like the unbelievers in their futile customs, their empty superstitions, and their fear-based interpretations of the heavens and so forth. Um, so there, there's no point in trusting in a worthless object, objects. Idols are nothing to fear. They really are powerless. And they're not to be revered. Not to be revered. Now, verses 3 to 5, it might sound uh, vaguely familiar, uh, it might bring to mind the image of a modern custom, uh, the Christmas tree. And so I don't know if that came to mind as we read, but some have said that this passage makes it wrong to have a Christmas tree. And from what I've researched, I, I don't see that being a proper interpretation there. And so let me, not to offend anyone, but let me try to clarify what I mean there. The modern tradition of a Christmas tree is not connected to idolatry of the Old Testament. The tree is not an idol, as it was back in Jeremiah's time. Um, clearly, that's true. Uh, we, we don't have people bowing down to our Christmas trees and, and declaring and worshiping it. Uh, and, and so here are some principles that I think are good to remember and a little bit of history to put this in perspective. Um, the Christmas tree, the, the customer, the tradition of having a Christmas tree is, is neither commanded nor is it prohibited in Scripture. Now, it would be prohibited if we say that, um, that it is an idol 
like object? How can it become that? So maybe if, if people are setting up a Christmas tree, perhaps, and all it means to them is, oh, yippee, I'm going to get more stuff, and it's all about me and what I get, uh, and it's devoid of any associated meaning with uh, the birth of Christ, then perhaps it's become an idol. Um, and perhaps a person that is in that mindset is completely unaware that it, that it is an idol. But for the believer, we can be assured that as long as we're associating that celebration and that custom with the birth of Christ, it seems perfectly fine. Uh, it dates back to the European Christian uh, origins of Germany and Scandinavia in the 1500s. And the custom uh, has evolved over the years and uh, uh, it, as it was imported or uh, immigrated here to the United States, um, it has become what it is today over the last uh, four or 500 years. Uh, and so there's, there's no particular spiritual significance to having a Christmas tree or not having a Christmas tree. Just because you have one doesn't make you more spiritual or less spiritual. Um, and, and it's interesting to maybe think that uh, unlike Judah, who was borrowing from the customs of their neighboring countries and the unbelievers, um, the, Christ, uh, the custom of the Christmas tree, uh, as far as it has propagated out, is actually non-Christians um, borrowing from the customs of Christianity. So it's kind of flipped around there. And, and really it comes down to being a personal decision and a conviction that you have before the Lord. Um, as with anything, the best motive is to please the Lord and to uh, do things for his glory. Um, I'd like to uh, give you just a few selected verses uh, from Romans 14 that will help us uh, with this topic. And uh, I, I hope that, uh, that through just these selected verses, we can come out with some principles for making decisions um, and, uh, and living more at peace and in unity with our brothers. So uh, Romans 14 uh, you can follow along. Uh, hopefully this is, I have this checked as the New King James, but if it's a different one, I apologize up front. Uh, starting with verse 5, it says, One person esteems one day uh, above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 6, He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. I'm going to skip down to the second part of verse 8. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And then verse 10, uh, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Verse 13, therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I'll skip down to 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking or Christmas trees, um, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. And then the ending of that chapter, uh, it uh, crescendos to, for whatever is not done from faith is sin. So the principles, things to ask ourselves uh, as we're trying to evaluate the appropriateness of a particular custom um, that is not prohibited or commanded in Scripture, uh, is it lawful? Is it prohibited in Scripture? Is it uh, commanded? Uh, and so we're, we're not to allow anything to become a point of dispute or division uh, or uh, condemnation of another or uh, cause us to show contempt for someone else because of their practice. Um, the second question is, so is it lawful? The second question is, is it loving to others? Is it keeping the peace and building up one another? Is it done in faith, serving Christ with a clear conscience and not doubting? That's really important that we do anything that we do with a clear conscience. Um, and then uh, we'll go on to verses uh, 6 through 10 now. Uh, I've titled this Yahweh's Greatness Contrasted. Verse 6, inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For from among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. 
but they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates. It is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. The work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the metalsmith, blue and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skillful men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. So you see Jeremiah has set up a clear contrast here between the true God and the, the so-called false uh, gods, so-called gods that are false. The one true God, who is he? He's unique, completely unique. He's um, totally unlike us. He's completely other than us. He's unique. He's supreme. He's awesome in reputation. And his name carries weight and reputation uh, throughout uh, creation. Um, and he's sovereign over all. He's sovereign, not just over Israel, but he's sovereign over all the nations. He has all authority and wisdom. And he is the living, eternal, and all-knowing God. When we say all-knowing, remember, remember the word, it's omniscient, right? All-knowing. So that's the one true God. Uh, on the other hand, we have the false so-called gods, uh, the idols that are worthless and powerless. And um, all of their idolatry and worship is vanity and foolishness. In other words, what the, the pagan priests had been teaching, uh, their instruction to the people, their, their false doctrines, were nothing but emptiness and lies. They were vanity and foolishness. These idols are dead, they're immobile, they're temporary, and in their silence are really mocking the people that are worshiping them. And so in verse 9, we see uh, just a glimpse into the significant effort of these idolatrous people. Um, the, it had become uh, really an industry. Uh, and so the idol worshipers and the craftsmen, the metalsmiths, all the skilled workers, um, what a... What an uh, uh, amazing status or state that they had come to. Uh, their corrupted imaginations, their foolish affections for these things, um, and the wasted skills and resources, what could have been uh, truly uh, given to God's glory, they're being wasted uh, on these worthless things. And so when we look at their practices, it seems strange. It's very, very strange to us. Um, how can they believe that an inanimate object can do anything? What a waste. I mean, de decorating their gods with silver and gold and clothing, fine, you know, what would be royal clothing. Um, so much time and energy in bringing the silver and gold uh, from the western limits of the ancient world. When they talk about Tarshish, that was considered to be the western limit. So they had gone through a lot of effort uh, to, uh, to, to bring this worship practice uh, to the people. And so uh, yes, we, we look back and it's strange, certainly, but it's good for us to consider the application here for us. Is there any area of our lives that has our heart's affection um, and, and resources more than Jesus? Just pause to think about that. Is there any area of our lives that have our heart's affections and resources more than Jesus? Verse 11, a familiar proverbial warning. So it's just one verse, and I, I wanted to uh, clarify a couple things on that before we move into the rest. <clears throat> so verse 11, Thus you shall say to them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Now this is the only Aramaic verse in Jeremiah. The whole rest of the book is in Hebrew, but here uh, it's written in Aramaic. And and so what that says to me is a couple things. This, this may have been a very familiar anti-idol proverb, a familiar anti-idol proverb. Um, now, I need to back up and explain that the Targum, which is an interpretive translation of Hebrew scripture portions into Aramaic uh, during this time, and for the next couple hundred years, uh, the, tar the Targum says that this particular verse was probably a shortened version of of a letter that was sent to the um, exiled leaders of Judah in Babylon, along with Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin. Um, and so it's, it's a message uh, implying that only Yahweh uh, is able to create and intervene and judge. Um, it, it, it was the, the false idols will all perish. Uh, they've never created anything. 
and they must be carried around or propped up. And I think that was an important message that, uh, that God, through Jeremiah, he wanted to make sure that everyone could understand in the common language of that time that, um, that the, these uh, false idols or false gods uh, were going to uh, die. And yes, they're already dead uh, in, in and of themselves, but if there's any demonic attachment uh, to those idols, certainly in the long run, they will be cast into the lake of fire and they will die ultimately. Um, so there, there is a figurative meaning to that as well. But if, if you think back to the, the sequence of the empires of this time, uh, certainly Babylon is, is uh, predominant as an empire and a ruling um, kingdom of this time. But if you remember, the next empire that, that uh, comes in is the Medo-Persian Empire. So uh, Babylon, Persia, and that, that happened in about 539 BC. So the the date of the writing of this particular letter is in about 609 BC. Remember 586 BC, Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed. And then there's the, the 70 years of captivity goes by. And uh, right toward the end of that, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire comes into being. Um, and they, they conquer Babylon and take over. And so that's about 539 BC. And uh, so during this time... Um, Aramaic became more of the common language and continued on until the next empire, which, which was what? You remember, it was Greece. So Babylon, Persia, Greece. And that was, uh, they took over in about 330 BC. So for a couple hundred years, Aramaic became the common language of the people uh, in the empire to include the Palestinian Israeli land. Um, after Greece took over, uh, certainly the common language uh, switched over to Koine Greek. Yeah, so, so Greece took over and the common language of the people in Israel uh, became Koine Greek. And of course, we know that that's the language that uh, the New Testament is written in. Uh, so God wants to get his word to the people and he wants everyone to understand it. So Jeremiah is about to drive home the point. We worship the God who created us. And carries us, right? Did you see the contrast? Uh, it's not like the, the idols that need to be carried and create nothing. And so verses 12 through 16, Yahweh's glory is displayed. He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. That is, there's noise, the noise of waters. And he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image. For his molded image is falsehood. And there is no breath in them. They are futile, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. For he is the maker of all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Jeremiah declares the true uh, power and wisdom of God. And, uh, and it's the true God's wisdom and power um, that we'll look at here. Um, first, God's power to create and sustain. He created all things and he sustains all things by his word. Uh, verse 12, he created the heavens and the earth and all things, and to include the nations. And there, verse 13, he even creates the weather and sustains that. He sustains the earth through uh, the, the, the waters that come down to water the earth. Um, and all that the earth grows and produces is ultimately from him. And so he controls the weather. He controls the climate, regardless of what we try to do to mess it up. Uh, but um, all the resources are by him and through him. Uh, it is not the bales. So it's the, the, the bales were uh, were given credit by the idolater uh, for having produced things from the earth instead of giving the credit to God. And so, um, so we have the true God's power and we have the true God's wisdom, the wisdom to adopt and to establish his people. He is their portion. Israel is his inheritance. So it's two-way. It's a special relationship. And he's not like the false gods 
They are treasured among all the nations. They are called out and established from among all the nations as a a special and treasured people. All right, verses uh, 17 to 18. The time has come. Gather up your wares from the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will throw out at this time the inhabitants of the land and will distress them that they may find it so. So this is, this is uh, just an inserted warning. Uh, you remember a week ago we had the tornado warning at uh, 12.02 and maybe your phone went off and uh, kind of startled us out of a deep sleep. But, um, but it, it's kind of that same idea of he's trying to startle them and wake them up to, uh, to hopefully see the goodness of God and, and to bring, come back into relationship with him. So warning, warning, uh, prepare to leave quickly you who dwell under siege. Verse 17, it says, inhabitant of the fortress, those who dwell under siege. Um, and so the Lord's trying to get their attention and effectively saying, come to your senses, wake up. Um, now, the, the term, I will throw out, uh, it literally means in, in the original language to, to slingshot out, to slingshot out. And so when you think of um, an object, a rock, perhaps uh, being slung out of a slingshot, um, how fast and far that goes. And so God's saying uh, this, I want to slingshot you out um, fast and far from where you are. Uh, it was interesting. I was trying to determine a, uh, where this picture would come from here, but uh, uh, somebody who's skilled at using a slingshot, they actually can uh, cause the energy of that uh, rock to be about the same as a 44 caliber bullet. So quite, quite powerful and deadly. Um, so I will throw out fast and far. And so God's given uh, Jeremiah this vision of prophesied events that are, that are coming and all the associated distress of the deportation, the plundering and the, the destruction. And so, um, and so God's given that, that vision to him. Now in the, the first picture on the upper left, you, you'll see some artists imagination of what it might look like. Uh, when the armies are surrounding and they're they're building their siege works and um, and setting up to destroy the city and they're they're um, they're capturing the, the city and destroying it. The second picture is uh, somebody's idea of what it might have been like uh, deporting the people. Now, I'm sure they're they're watching over them and trying to keep them in line. We're talking about a lot of people. I don't remember exactly uh, what they say was the population of Jerusalem at that time. But if you think about it, this is not just a walk across the county line or down over to the next state. Uh, going from Jerusalem to uh, where they were going in their captive land was about 800 miles, as I understand. So this is quite a trek. Um, and so uh, you can imagine the, the shame and the, and the sadness that goes along with that. All right, let's go on to verses uh, 19 through 22. Jeremiah gives voice to Judah's pain. All right, so that he's going to, to make a declaration here <clears throat> on behalf of Judah and certainly personally. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is severe, but I say truly this is an infirmity and I must bear it. My tent is plundered and all my cords are broken. My children have gone from me and they are no more. There is no one to pitch my tent anymore and set up my curtains for the shepherds have become dull hearted and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the report has come, and a great commotion out of the north country, to make the cities of Judah Judah desolate, a den of jackals. Verse 19, when he mentions hurt and wound and infirmity, this is far more than a physical hurt and wound, uh, though some physical pain is probably inevitable, and involved in the, the calamity and the, uh, the captivity. But this is more about the pain and the grief of soul. So he's, he's describing figuratively um, his, the pain of his soul. And he says, I must bear it. And so there, there were unavoidable consequences to um, the, the sin of the people. Uh, it, it had gone over. They were given over. And, um, and, and now they must bear it. Verse 20, um, it seems that this grief 
is more about what was lost for the loss of homes, the loss of family. Uh, and it seems that they're mourning their loss more than the guilt of their sinful rebellion. And that, that can happen to any of us uh, if our hearts are not ready to, to uh, turn and repent. We, we're thinking about this world. We're not thinking about um, our relationship with the Lord. Verse 21, um, he gives a, the, the reason. Uh, certainly, each individual is responsible, but the spiritual and political leaders, the shepherds, had become corrupted. So these corrupted uh, leaders, the, the shepherds, had led the people astray. And the people had a choice to whether or not they would follow them, but they did. And regarding the shepherds, God has a higher standard for those who lead and teach. But we still have an individual responsibility, each of us, to seek the Lord, to study his word, uh, and to walk in the Spirit's wisdom and power. And when, when we think of that, what do we think of the, the New Testament uh, term for, for right? And so the Bereans, uh, they uh, searched the scriptures daily to see uh, that what Paul was, was preaching was accurate regarding the Lord. And so we each have a responsibility to um, read the, the word daily, uh, to know it, to learn it, um, and to uh, uh, walk in the Spirit. So the shepherds were not seeking the Lord. They're, they're, and because they're not seeking the Lord, they're effectively detached from any wisdom and any uh, relationship uh, with the Lord. And as a consequence, verse 22, the people are scattered and the cities are emptied by the Babylonian armies, this invader that's uh, coming. All right, verses uh, 23 to 25. Jeremiah is uh, now going to pray for uh, both mercy and justice. And God is certainly perfect in his mercy and justice. They're always in balance perfectly. This is considered uh, an autobiographical uh, section here toward the end of this chapter. Uh, he's praying for himself as an, a representative of the nation, uh, perhaps uh, for a remnant that would ultimately be teachable, in their hearts and uh, turn back to the Lord. Verse 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. O Lord, correct me, but with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Pour out your fury on the Gentiles who do not know you and on the families who do not call on your name. For they have eaten up Jacob, devoured him, and consumed him, and made his dwelling place desolate. You remember back a couple chapters uh, that uh, God told Jeremiah not to pray for his people, that God would not hear him. Um, and so I think this is uh, quite interesting that he decides to pray, but he prays that Yahweh would lead him and correct him without the severity of wrath that was warranted by the breaking of their covenant. Um, and so he prays for himself on behalf of the people, uh, kind of a, uh, a priestly uh, attitude. Uh, that, that's verse 24. And Jeremiah knows and he reminds us that God is certainly in full control and he knows best. It reminds me of the account of 2 Samuel 24. Uh, you remember back when we were, a couple years ago, when we were still in Samuel. Uh, 2 Samuel 24 uh, particularly verse 14, but the account is, if you remember, uh, David was not told to do a census of the people, and yet he decided to, on his own accord to go out and uh, do a census of the people. And so when he did that, he realized that he had uh, done something that was contrary to what the Lord wanted. He had never consulted God on that. And so he was convicted in his heart, and when he spoke with the prophet, the prophet said that uh, that he had uh, strayed and that God was going to punish him. And he gave him a choice of a few different things. It was a, a plague or it was at the hand of man or it was God himself that would punish. And remember David, he uh, cast his, his heart uh, on the Lord and he chose to have the Lord punish him because he knows the Lord's character. He knows that uh, even the Lord's discipline and punishment Will be, would be perfect, and that God's mercy at some point would intervene, unlike man, like a Babylonian or somebody else, uh, that would perhaps never show mercy, and the, the, uh, 
the punishment would be far more severe at the hands of man. So all that to say is we have a will, we all make choices, but our plans and our decisions are imperfect apart from God. Uh, it makes me think of a couple Proverbs here uh, that hopefully are familiar. Proverbs 16, 9, a, man, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Uh, Proverbs 21, verses 1 to 2, and these are not in your notes, but uh, uh, you can follow along later. Proverbs 21, 1 to 2, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. God is always making his guidance available to us. Never forget that. But are we actually listening? It's available to us, but we have to listen and we have to, to follow him. Um, you know, no one did that better than Jesus. When he was here on the earth, he only did what the father told him to do. And he only said what the father told him to say. And so may we be like that, uh, modeling our Lord's obedience and doing his will. Um, so our, our ability to truly self-direct is, is kind of an illusion. Uh, <laughs> we think that we're in charge and, and we're, we're just really not. I love this quote from Spurgeon uh, who said this in a sermon many years ago. He who is his own guide is guided by a fool. He that trusts his own understanding proves that he has no understanding. Isn't that interesting? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 certainly comes to mind here. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. God is always making his guidance available. We just need to listen. And for our part in the relationship and the discipleship process, um, do we remember our identity? Remember what doulos means. It's, we're bond servants. We were bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. We're servants of the Lord. And uh, as bond servants, we're consumed with the will of the master. The final accounting of our lives would be so much more simple and easy if we were consumed with the will of the master perfectly. Uh, and that requires something called abiding. So finally, um, he says that vengeance belongs to God, that, that only he knows the heart uh, of anyone. And we're not to take a vengeance into our own hands. It belongs to the Lord. And he's going to do it perfectly. He's going to do it with the right heart and the right amount of pressure. Um, it makes me think of uh, Hebrews 12, verses uh, 5 through 11. I'll read a couple selected verses from that. But when Jeremiah says, correct me without anger, it's the idea of, it's reinforcing uh, that there is a relationship here of a, a perfect and benevolent, loving father who is a good father. Uh, Hebrews 12, 6 says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So if, if we're being chastened or disciplined, um, it, it's just evidence that he loves us. And so we're to endure that chastening uh, because God is dealing with us as sons. Furthermore, we've had fathers who corrected us. Um, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? So there's life that comes out of discipline. It's, it's not an ending. Uh, the, the, the idea, the goal is that we would be partakers of his holiness. It's going to yield peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we really want to be trained by it. We want to be teachable and uh, trained by it. Paul basically says the same thing in what, uh, what's going to happen in the end for those who are going to be judged, uh, those who have not repented. 1 Thessalonians 1 6 to 10, uh, hopefully again familiar, but 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10, says that God will repay with tribulation those who trouble you, that is, trouble, those who are troubling the believers or persecuting them. Um, it, it's, this is awful. Uh, he, he's, uh, when he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, he's going to take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey 
the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Some final thoughts as we, uh, we wrap up this uh, study tonight on chapter 10. Uh, Jeremiah is a wonderful example for us in his obedience and his attitude in serving the Lord. And um, it, it suggests uh, perhaps some things that we can take away from all that we've said. Uh, it's a good daily practice, and frankly, more than daily, uh, moment by moment, as often as necessary. It's a good daily practice to confess, confess our dependence on the one true God. He's our almighty. He's our sovereign. He is eternal. He is all-knowing. He's living. He's our ever-present master and savior. Um, another point is, I think it would be wise for us to be valiant for the truth showing grace to one another as we listen and respond to God's word and to his spirit. And again, that, that is the essence, the nature of abiding, is that we're in that living relationship, getting all of our life from him. And how we do that is by praying always about everything, knowing and holding on to his promises, following the spirit's leading and storing up treasures in heaven as we do his will. And finally, we, we want to act responsibly and strive to do God's will. Then we can just leave the, res, leave the results up to God. So do his will and not worry about the results. Trust him to accomplish his purposes at the perfect time for his glory and for the good of his people. Father, thank you so much for this time together to study your word. Thank you for preserving your word all these millennia for us to know your will. We love you, and we ask that uh, we would glorify you in every area of our lives and keep our eyes open to the opportunities that are before us to bring the warning to those who have strayed or have not yet bowed the knee to you. Uh, may we be ready to give an answer for the hope that was, is within us. And it's in your precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.